This is Today's Business Leaders, actionable advice from real-world professionals. And now, here's your host, Gabe Arnold. All right, today I'm super excited. I have Les Cowie on the show, uh, and we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and all sorts of fun, exciting things that he's done over the years. So welcome to the show, Les. Hey, thank you, Gabe. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. A yeah. Very interesting show. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, to get started, tell me, tell me when you first realized you're an entrepreneur. What, when was that moment or when did that happen for you? Oh, Dave, it, Gabe, it was um, kind of a mixture between fate and the good Lord. I sort of had no option. <laughs> At uh, age 27, we lost our second son, age tw- two and a half, we oh. lost the brain cancer. And my wife, I was then uh, in uh, the biggest business city in South Africa, Johannesburg, and uh, I was director on the board of directors of a consulting company, a Swiss consulting company operating in South Africa, had a great job, earning a great income. My wife just wanted to get out of Johannesburg. Too many memories. Yeah. So we went back to the city of her home and uh, literally had to stay with her parents for a while. And I said, gosh, friend, what what am I going to do? She said, hey, you've had this great track record where, you know, you've you've turned companies that had 48% throughput to 82% throughput and made them profitable with training programs for technical people and developing uh, people with poor education to do high technology jobs. Uh, Start a consultancy doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we went down then, of course, I had a lucky break, as I say, fate and and the good Lord. um, And one of the uh, technical universities there asked me to establish a training center based on the methodologies I'd built in these businesses. So at age 27, I was given a one-year contract to package all this know-how, and it was really the early days of multimedia training. Mm -hmm. It was video-based and audio-based, none of what we've got today. (laughs) And that's when I learned, Gabe, the first lesson of entrepreneurship. And that is, uh, and I know you know it, Build it once, sell it many times over, right? That's Uh, right. (laughs) uh, The only thing was uh, the college, you know, charged all these students for coming in and learning my technology, and they made all the money. (laughs) You got paid once. (laughs) I still paid my fee, and I said, hey, this doesn't work. (laughs) <laughs> well, when I finished that, you know, I just got known by many companies in South Africa for being able to develop methods of teaching people who'd had a poor education, which were mainly our black population, you know, mm-hmm. who in the apartheid days were treated so badly, and our Indian population and so on. And so uh, suddenly I found myself being invited to do consulting assignments. And so <laughs> what I did was I then learned that lesson, build it once, sell it many times over. And I created with one company, a joint venture that did training of uh, truck drivers in these big 18 wheeler trucks that handled, you know, uh, explosive products, uh, chemical products, you know, hazardous chemicals and so on. And we created it once, sold it many times over, made a lot of money. At that time, a lot of, Black people were starting their own businesses and a lot of young South Africans coming out of college were struggling to get jobs, starting their own businesses. So we created a package called Being a Director. Made it once, sold it many times, made a lot of money. And I know because I've seen your website, you know that formula, you've done it yourself. (laughs) Yes, that's that's definitely wise and I'm glad you pointed it out because if the ideal is one to many. That's, that's the way I always kind of phrase it. It's like if you can do do it one time or have one conversation and it help a lot of people, then you're you're light years ahead. And and wealth and money, the purpose of wealth and money is to buy time. Yeah. And and what you just said is buying time. You do an extremely good job one time through. And obviously I'm sure you probably in some cases went back and updated or changed things, but it wasn't like it was a massive redo you know you build you build things out once and then you change a lot of lives and it's very easy to make money 
actually that way. Well, then, then I learned what I believe is the second lesson of entrepreneurship, and that is build your business on asset-based products. Stay true to your core, mm -hmm. but there are things aligned to your core that you can do. And having learned that, <laughs> I then broke the rule because <laughs> I came here to the USA and uh, did my first trip, fell in love with the country, but I discovered the magic of glass fiber water slides. And we didn't have those in South Africa. So I took a thousand pictures. And when I got back to South Africa, um, I found a young surfer who was also uh, a graduate engineer. And he took a look at this, uh, he, based on my description, he said, heaven's sakes, uh, the terminal velocity of people coming out of that thing, they're going to open the pool and you're going to kill them. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Eventually, he, he got the idea, he, he found three moles. We started a company called Super Tubes, and that was named after, in uh, any surfo listening to your program will know, Jeffrey's Bay in South Africa. Oh, it, cool. Yeah, it's a wave where you can serve too for more than a mile. And uh, it's phenomenal. So we called these water slides super tubes. And I then started a franchise around the country, which became a total cash cow. And I then learned the third principle of being an entrepreneur is cash. And cash flow allows you to do a lot of things. <laughs> That is for sure. Cash is king. Yeah. <laughs> everything can be going great. And if your cash flattens out, everything is not going great anymore. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the entrepreneurial venture, you, it doesn't, I don't want to give the impression that being an entrepreneur is uh, all golden. Because <laughs> things go wrong. You know, you have your tough times. Uh, when color television came to South Africa, because I had, a whole bunch of television crews making black and white TV for these education programs. I switched them to color equipment and we did color TV and created programming for the then government stations. And I was yeah. risky enough to get involved with a group of consultants who we started the first independent black television station in South wow. Africa. And we followed the American format, American news, you know, Fat Albert, Mel, you know, just the whole idea was to provide a role model of what black folk in America were achieving in the 80s mm -hmm. and, and just to provide inspiration to folk who were desperate for creating something, you know, of their lives. Hmm. But the South African Secret Service, uh, um, looked at that and they examined the white guys involved in the training, found that when I was at university, I'd been politically involved, decided that I was going to convert this very successful station that was taking advertising revenues from the South African government stations. And I was given six weeks to leave the country. And Holy cow. Fortunately, friends here in the USA, um, because I'd been buying programming here but mm -hmm. i had done a job for the 3m company in south africa and 3m international told ibm about it long story short i ended up in the usa and thank god um you know uh, those folk helped me get a green card i got my family in and it's been the most wonderful thing ever since yeah but it's tough when, you know, you're an outsider coming into the USA just suddenly to start up and be an entrepreneur. Yeah. If you haven't been at college, you know, or you haven't been in a fraternity, you don't have all the people who can open doors for you. Right. But as luck would have it, the company that employed me as a senior VP of marketing and sales uh, was actually had... Uh, was actually controlled by a venture capital company. Oh, okay. And I got involved in restructuring sales and marketing and then doing the business plan and successfully helping them sell the company. And then for the last 38 years, 
uh, anywhere my venture capital friends have put money into buying a medium-sized business or a large business, I got dragged in. <laughs> and so I, uh, I learned a tremendous amount about American companies and American culture and made a lot of contacts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that was a, a baptism in a different way of doing business, a different way of funding, you know, a different way, um, uh, you know, and culture. Yeah. In South Africa, <laughs> as an executive, my secretary would bring me tea at 11 a.m. on a silver tray. <laughs> <laughs> For my first day in the USA, they said, because I said, hey, it's 11 a.m., no one's brought me tea. <laughs> Les, you want tea, you want coffee? Go get Come it. Here. We'll show you where it is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, but uh, then once again, you know, fate and the good Lord as things happen, Gabe. Um, oh, gosh, 18 months ago, I lost my wife to... to um, Colon cancer. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Wow. And she had been nagging me for her last three years to put all these ideas that I had learned in all of the venture capital companies I'd been in, in some of the background in South Africa, and to put them into three books. Mm -hmm. And so I then first published this one, New ah. Job Fast Start, Seven Steps to be Seen Mastering Your New Job Quickly. Wow. And then companies saw it and they said, hey, uh, we'd like to make that a policy in our organizations. Uh, you know, uh, we don't want to hire a training officer for it. Can you, can you teach just mentors, people who are there, how to apply those simple seven principles? So I then did the in-company version <laughs> of the same thing. <laughs> nice. And then based on really the way we turned around um, these companies, every one of those companies, you know, you hear um, love your customer mm -hmm. and all about the customer. And uh, I heard the other day the saying, love your employee. Your employee, if you train them right, will help you love your customer. Yes. And so those books on the seven step, it horrifies me that all of those companies I was involved in, 85% uh, of them had a smart sign-on procedure, even to the extent of some video programs, you know, teaching uh, benefits and sexual harassment <laughs> and <laughs> so on. But the minute that sign-on process was finished, they'd, take the employee, walk them across to a workstation, introduce them to whomever might be there at the time, and then dump them to learn the job by trial and error. Wow. And in the companies we were involved in, that, just, that was no good. We yeah. had to hire the right people to do the right job. We had to get them productive very fast. And so I learned that in every job, there are seven different X-ray points of view Okay. that are common to every job. And if you teach people what those seven steps are, you give them the things to do and the questions to ask, the job entrant can capture everything to do with the job, learn the job, interrelate with employees, you know, colleagues and customers faster than before. Let the job entrant be proactive. So many corporations wait for the training development officer to package a training course, well, they're not, they're not enough months in the year or enough years. <laughs> they would like to do that, yeah. Jobs. So uh, I learned through those venture capital companies here, you've got to excite people, motivate them to be proactive. And mm -hmm. they get so much joy out of the job when they're productive quickly. Hmm. That's very wise. Yeah. So now, um, you know, once again, uh, if I just do consulting, there's a limitation to the number of hours in, the, in a month that I have. Right. So you get, as you know, you get a limit on your consulting hours. Yeah. Right? When you've got the books, that's another source of revenue. 
And mm -hmm. then like you've done, if you establish a software program, mm -hmm. it makes it easy for people to do these things. And that's what I'm working on now, uh, cool. developing that, that software program. Because the fourth principle of entrepreneurship that I learned is when you've got the cash, then invest in assets aligned to what you do, if possible, that can generate more cash. Yeah. You know, um, and put a team together that you can excite. Yeah. You can commit to that and also derive reward out of it. And I know yeah. you know that. <laughs> I, I, I love it. These, these are excellent. What are, um, can we dive into the seven the seven principles or the seven things that you need when you're coming on board. Can you share some of that? Sure. Um, every job has an environment. Okay. okay. It has an internal environment and an external environment. So when somebody comes into the job, the first thing they need to know are what are things, the things in my workspace in my internal environment that I need to have to do the job. What are the okay. documents? What are the software systems? What are the, Oh, and by the way, who are the people around me close to my workstation that I have to interact with? Mm -hmm. Okay, And what do they need from me and what do I need from them? And so if I ask the right questions, I can capture that really, very really quickly. And, oh, suddenly I know how to interact with the people around me and, and get them to help me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the external environment, well, I have to relate to other departments in the company not at my workstation or other organizations outside of the company okay in the case of a cashier in an automation dealership uh, for a mercedes-benz uh, dealership they right. have to interrelate with mercedes-benz and automation corporate as well as the actual dealership so there's an external environment okay salesmen understand that more than anybody because they deal most in the external environment yeah, and they're always passing it into the internal. <laughs> so quickly, get people to understand the environment. Secondly, process flow. What's the process flow? Every job has a starting point, and you go in a sequence, and it has an end point. But there are some things that can go in parallel, and there are some things that start later in the process. So get them to ask the questions so that they understand, what is the sequence of my job? The benefit of that is they very quickly get into the rhythm of the job, okay? And they know, okay, I've, I've got it. There's a flow and there's a rhythm. And sometimes there's an on-demand thing that I've got to deal with, okay? Gotcha. Third thing is frequencies. And in my marketing days, I learned the Pareto principle, which says that, you know, 80% of the income comes from 20% <clears throat> of the customers. Yep. <laughs> 20% of the inventory is demanded 80% of the time. Well, if you look at a job, 20% of the activities are performed 80% of the time. 20% hmm. of the faults in a job happen 80% of the time. <laughs> so somebody coming into a job, if you want them to be productive quickly, at least get them to capture that 20% and maybe you know, five or 10% more of something that's critical to customer satisfaction or cost containment, you know, or quality performance or safety. So, you know, I say, get them into that 20, 25% quickly and boom, they're 85 to 90% productive. The rest they'll pick up from experience. That's brilliant. Yeah, number, number four is the, the, uh, the processes, every one of those processes has ins and outs because to do a particular process, there are things that you have to have ready to apply the process <clears throat> to produce the outputs that you want. Okay. And usually there's some kind of a feedback mechanism, like when you drive your car, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that damn GPS thing. Uh, so you set the direction you're going that's the feedback of where the feedback is. You can see where you are along the road, where you are along the road, and oops, suddenly the feedback doesn't match the feed forward, and you hear that horrible voice that says, "In the next corner, 
take a legal U-turn. <laughs> yeah. In the job, you know, I find a lot of people, a lot of corporations teach the how to the job, but not what are you supposed to achieve, what's the level of standards and quality, and what's the feedback you should be getting to tell you that you're getting there. And yeah. I encourage that that's, you know, that's developed. For critical jobs, nobody understands checklists better than pilots or astronauts or doctors or nurses. Hmm. So in some cases, especially where something is a, a low frequency event but is critical, hey, do a checklist. Yeah. Then number six uh, is faults. 20% of the faults happen 80% of the time. And I, I've been involved with some major, major corporations in this country who have wonderful, even video-based training programs. But when you look at them, they teach how to do it correctly. They don't seem to sit back and say, all right, you need to know that things go wrong. And these are the things that go wrong. These are the symptoms that you can recognize when it's going wrong. And for, if you see a symptoms, it's probably got more than one cause. And you've got to make sure that you do the corrective action for the correct cause. Nobody understands that better than a doctor. Okay, when he prescribes you medication, it better be for the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> in a job, we, you know, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter how elementary our job, but at the higher levels, at the executive levels, it's more critical because millions of dollars can be involved. Mm -hmm. Then the final thing that I learned here in the USA all the best executives or managers that I've encountered have what I call the patrol pattern and inspection sequence. And what is that? Well, if you know how the job should be done and you've got a whole lot of processes in different places around your workstation or in your department, develop, literally get off your ass and move around every now and again. Mm -hmm. And, um, anticipate, look for symptoms of something going wrong. Because if you recognize a symptom, you can fix it before it's a costly or security or safety error. Mm -hmm. uh, even if your job, if you're an accountant, you know, and you pull something up on the screen, you, have a, you should have a patrol pattern and inspection sequence. Your eyes should go this part of the screen, that part of the screen, there. Oh, if this doesn't reconcile, there I've got a problem I must go fix. You know, patrol patterns and inspection sequence, those are the seven steps. And if you give a job entrant those X-ray views of the job, and in each of the seven steps, you give them the things to do and questions to ask, they'll very quickly catch on to everything that the job's about. They'll relate better to the people around them, and they will relate 10 times better to your customers. I'm blown away, man. That is powerful stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Coming from you, uh, that, I appreciate that, man. I'm not anywhere near to, as far down the road as you are, so I, I appreciate that compliment. But uh, that's, that's brilliant because the little things, like you pointed out, I, like we have, we have some pretty solid onboarding here. Yeah. And one thing I just never thought of is pointing out oh, here's the things that are going to go wrong and how to fix them. There like, you go. <laughs> like why, why do we not, and I've been doing this for a couple of years, <laughs> 20, yeah. Why, yeah. Why, do, why do people not see that? <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I, uh, I met with one of the biggest fast food organizations. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced by a friend and I thought, you know, am I going to go to this interview because – these guys have got, you know, everything in a manual. They've got videos. They've got all the training. And when I got to their people, I said, you know, wh what is it? You've got all the stuff. What, what is the problem you're having? Oh, we've got customer complaints. And, um, you know, we run out of inventory now and again. So I say, well, okay, so show me your fault diagnosis and correction. What do you mean? And here is one of the biggest international fast food organizations, and they don't teach 
fault, diagnosis, and correction. Why do why do we miss that? How does that happen? <laughs> and you know, this is an organization hiring kids out of high school, kids out of university, mm-hmm. you know, and putting them at a counter or at a window where customers come along and suddenly there's a point of irritation with the customer. Right. And oh, the person's dealing it with it for the first time and they don't know what to do. And uh, the complaint comes in, the manager says to them, what the hell happened here? And they say, oh, well, yeah, well, why didn't you just say this? Why didn't you just do that? Oh, I didn't think of that. Well, really, the question is, why didn't you teach me that at the beginning? Yeah. (laughs) And with that kind of organization, you don't just lose one customer, Gabe, as you know. You lose a family. Yeah. (laughs) And someone picking up for all the people at work for lunch, and you've upset them, (laughs) you lose a business customer. Thousands upon thousands of dollars for one complaint, or who knows how much, tens of thousands. Well, diagnosis and correction. And I've got a special methodology and approach that makes it so quick for people to do that. And, uh, you know, it's amazing when you say to someone, oh, what are the things that go wrong in this job? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I don't, you know, no, no, things go fine. We have Um, no problems ever. (laughs) Yeah. But when you actually drill down, when you have a set of, you know, things to do, questions to ask, they say, Oh, interesting that you should say that. Yes, you know, we, um, we have a problem. The check reader jams every now and again, you know. Or the accountant says, uh, oh, yeah, sometimes the warranty payment gets directed to the wrong dealership. That's not good. <laughs> okay, then what do you do? There's $180,000 sitting in somebody else's bank account. How do you deal with that and how do you prevent it happening so i'm sorry you hit my hobby horse no i i love it i i I, i'm i'm really dumbfounded for myself because i don't understand why i wouldn't have known to do that yeah it's uh, is it just the i do you think it maybe is just the idealistic nature of like a leader or a visionary or an entrepreneur that like we just forget that part of success is actually focusing on what could go wrong? You know, I don't know. I think it's this belief in, uh, oh, well, you've got to, you, you know, you've got to hire people with experience or you've got to allow someone to get experience. Mm-hmm. But I ask, what is experience? Well, experience is, okay, waiting around long enough for the low frequency events to have happened enough times for you to remember them. Wow. And fix them. Well, hey, if you study a job, and once again, you know the the 20%, 80%, and out of the 80% what's critical, Mm -hmm. if you just adopt that approach, oh, there's just so much you can put right in a business, you know, just so much. And when you think of customer interaction, you know, in a restaurant, on a service lane, in a dealership, you know, in a, a bank, in uh, even selling. Mm-hmm. Um, you can have a sales guy go in there and he's new in the job. You've got a major international customer. You lose the deal. Why? Because they came at him with an angle on negotiating and the kid didn't know how to, do, how to handle it. Yeah. And boom, you know, whereas if you've taken the benefit of some of the experienced sales guys who've been there, done that before, and you, you know, you put it together and you say to new guys coming in, all right, these kinds of things hopefully don't happen to you, but they might. Yeah. If they do, here's how you deal with them. And by the way, if he doesn't remember them, if you've captured them on one of these magic things, he can look it up real fast under the table, even while he's at the meeting. <laughs> that's right. So that, that's what my software is about. But it's funny, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if your kids, uh, 
if you have kids or if they're grown up yet. Um, he's almost seven. He's almost seven. Well, he's going to learn to adopt some of your practices. My eldest son is a movie producer. He makes, you know, Hollywood feature movies. Oh, that's cool. And uh, he, he applies these principles, especially because he's a producer mm -hmm. in, in negotiating strategies. And he gets invited here to do talks at the University of Central Florida Film School or Full Sail or at Valencia College. And one of the big things is on, you know, raising funds and negotiating and how to deal with things that come at you that are the equivalent of faults. Yeah. His first movie at age 24 was one called uh, The Blair Witch Project. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. That's brilliant. And, you know, since then, he learned a lot about negotiating with agents and investors and that, that kind of thing. And that, so, was, that was a breakout film. That was yeah. a revolutionary way to shoot. I remember I didn't watch the whole thing because I'm not much into that style of stuff. Yeah. But I, I read well, so much. My wife and I didn't think it was a great movie. <laughs> yeah, but, but what impressed me about it, because I did watch pieces of it, and I was, I was young when that came out, or younger. Yeah that I probably should go watch it. What I was super impressed about it, it was so disruptive to the industry that it was oh, just, yeah. it was yeah. mind-blowingly brilliant. That's incredible. Yeah. But I mentioned that because um, I didn't want to give the impression that the seven steps apply only to, you know, clerical, administrative, uh, technical, right. workshop-type jobs. They apply. Across the board. Across the board in selling and in management. And at those levels where hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars are involved, you know, they are more critical than ever. Yeah. So I really encourage people who are in organization development or talent development or HR, you know, um, when some, some people have a jaundiced view of folk in that profession mm -hmm. because what do they contribute to the income and what do they contribute to the bottom line kind of attitude? <clears throat> they can contribute a huge amount. Yeah. Simply by applying those principles at multiple levels in the organization. Yeah. So. Well, you've just made me like a half million dollars in 40 minutes. Oh, awesome. Uh, we need after the call to negotiate the commission. <laughs> now, that's the sixth principle of entrepreneurship. <laughs> Which is what? You better tell me now so I'm ready for the negotiation afterward. <laughs> and I'm just joking, of course. But it, but it is, as you know, the sixth principle of entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, that's, uh, that's really, really powerful stuff, Les. I'm... Um, for everybody watching and that hears this, go listen to this again, because this is probably the most critical lesson that you're going to hear about entrepreneurship um, that you're not going to be told elsewhere. Not Like I said, we, we dug into it a little bit and I don't really understand why we like to be idealistic or something, but we're yeah. totally shooting ourselves in the foot. <laughs> yeah. In at least one of the feet. <laughs> yeah. Both of them some days. <laughs> Holy cow. That's, uh, that's really, really powerful. Um, yeah. and, and so how did you, how did you discover this just exposure over the years or what do you think was, I mean, you, you just have a mastery of understanding these principles. So what was, cause I, I think that's the other lesson that might be here is, I mean, you, you've picked up some things that to work with one of the biggest or maybe the biggest fast food chain in the world. Um, you obviously figured something out. So how, how did you absorb that or discover that? Or what were the influences that helped you see differently? Because you see very, very differently than the rest of the world. Yeah. I go back to fate and the good Lord. Um, but, um, I mean, have we got time? This is not yeah. the yeah, we're story. Good. We're good. <laughs> um, it was strange, you know. And I was lucky at a very young age to, to have people take an interest in me and kind of put me in positions where, first of all, I learned training, then I learned HR, then I learned 
marketing and then export marketing to the USA. And then I got hired by this consulting firm. Mm -hmm. And they were consulting for a major textile company and had landed a large marketing exercise. They wanted somebody local to be a consultant there. I was hired. Mm -hmm. They won. As I arrived, the chairman of the company was involved in a board meeting and I, I sat in the reception area and waited for four and a half hours. And when he came out, he said, Les, um, the marketing consultancy has been cancelled. Uh, what else can you do? I said, oh, um, he said, just go, just go walk around the plant and think about it and come back and tell me. Hmm. So I walked around the plant, chatted to a few people, and long story short, discovered here was this high technology plant located in an area of um, an impoverished area with poor education, but with a very cheap labor force. Mm -hmm. They were achieving a throughput of 48% per shift. 48%. Okay. And um, the, as a result, the, the, because of the slow throughput, the, the low product rate was carrying a very high cost burden. Right. So their pricing made them uncompetitive. And they were, they were losing money. And as a marketing person, I picked up on that very quickly. Mm -hmm. But I then identified that the problem was with the machine technicians and with the uh, machine operators who were not being adequately trained. Okay. That's when I applied the principles of 2080. 20% 20 of the product was going through 80% of the time. 20% of the machine stoppages were happening 80% of the time. The technicians were high grade white technicians being paid uh, over $100,000 a year because of shortage of supply. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, I then recognized that if we could take uh, some of these um, local people and teach them the 20% that happens 80% of the time in maintenance, setup and repair, and also in op machine operation, okay, then we would be less dependent on the high skilled folk. The result of that was I started what was called the Red Hat and the Blue Hat Brigade. The experienced technician wore a red hat. The trained t local technician wore a blue hat. And the operators were trained on the 20% of product required 80% of the time. All of the setups and the repairs and the faults that happened and so on. Um, when the machine broke down, then the blue hat person went to the machine check, 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 using the visual checklist, check, 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 it's not in my range, book, red flag, and the red technician would come along and fix it. Well, we were able to reduce the payroll of red hat technicians, and the blue hat technicians were so proficient in what they did, the throughput went from 48% to 85%. Now, to teach the content in those two jobs, I had to teach them environment, the process for what to do, okay? <laughs> I had to teach them the frequencies. I had to teach them the ins and outs. You know, when you're doing this kind of repair, which parts do you need? Which tools do you need? You know, which yeah. options do you follow? Okay, what are the steps you do in fixing it? And what's the result? How do you test it? What's your feedback? The meter tells you this, the meter tells you that. What's the run rate? It should be this. Okay. All of that was in there. And so uh, I then taught them all the way through to fault diagnosis and correction and patrol pattern and inspection sequence. So kind of, I'd like to say I was really smart. <laughs> it kind of happened, you know, <clears throat> that's why I say fate and the good Lord. I learned those things. And when I came here to the USA, I found myself forced to apply them in similar situations, but to more sophisticated people. Yeah. And Gabe, you know, it's just those seven principles apply. 
And uh, I'd like to say I'm super smart, but uh, I've just learned over the years, there's not a job yet that I've sat down with in any corporation so far where they can say any one of the seven principles don't apply. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Yeah. It, it really, um, it really highlights something for me that I never thought about in this way before. And that is um, my two foundational like books that I read as a teenager that really drove me to decide to be an entrepreneur were the E-Myth, which is yeah. now the E-Myth Revisited, and then the Toyota Way Handbook. Yeah. And if you put those two together, it's, it's very manufacturing based mindset. Yeah. And that w what I have today all of my successful stuff and anything that's ever worked, I've based on those principles. So it's really interesting to me that still today, if we frame it and use it right, we're still highly influenced by the industrial revolution and everything that we learned then. And like yeah. your, your entire consultancy and the brilliance of what you discovered or found or created or all those three things, whatever it is, is based on a manufacturing problem. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. You talk about books, for those listening though, there's a book that I've just completed that I found incredibly useful, written by a CPA named Joel Block. Okay. Who now manages very successful investment funds. And it's called Stop Hustling Gigs and Start Building a Business. Cool, okay. And he expounds on that philosophy of, you know, generating cash and then investing in assets, okay, that can generate more money for you and how to do that. And um, so once again, Joel Block, stop hassling gigs and start building a business. Awesome book, awesome book. Very cool. Thank you. I'm always looking for reading recommendations, so that's excellent. Hey, I've enjoyed myself so much, and uh, I've got to thank you for your show. It's just interesting that, um, you know, you've had so many what start out as apparently casual discussions, and I've got to tell you, I've I've learned from a bunch of them that I've watched. Oh, well, thank you. That means a lot. That's, I don't, I'm, the way I created the show, I think I've mentioned this before on the show, but the way I created the show is like, I'm like, well, I want to hang out with smart entrepreneurs like Les and, you know, Jay and jeet and i don't know all those dozens and dozens almost almost over 100 people now i think um you know entrepreneurs like i want to hang out with cool entrepreneurs and i'm like well if we're going to do that then we should make it valuable to everybody yeah and and man it has been just mind-blowing because i come i come into it with no agenda i didn't even have the first question in the first few shows now i at least have one question and that's it yeah um, and we just get to really kind of share your experience and dive into what you learn and um, I am just completely blown away and thankful and grateful that you were willing to invest this time here today, Les, because you've changed my life. So thank you. Oh, well, of course. Yeah. Thank you, man. So I, I highly, 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 highly recommend that everybody buy your books. What's the easiest place to find those? Just on LesCowie.com? Well, they can go there or they can go to Amazon. Cool. But when they go to Amazon, they got to search by the book name because there are apparently so many Cowies. Oh, okay. <laughs> In Amazon, you're, you know, uh, my Show SEO hasn't got me to the top of the list yet. That's all right. Show us the two covers again and read off the titles for me, please. Yeah. We make sure we buy the right one. <laughs> New job, fast start. Okay. Seven steps to be seen mastering your new job quickly. But awesome. if you search on new job, fast start, seven steps, it comes up. Cool. Then the one for companies, the in-company version is called Seven Steps for Employees to Be Successful, cool. the company version. Nice. And then the latest one is called Getting More with Less. No pun intended. <laughs> but it, it just rattled me in most of the venture capital um, opportunities that we had. The leadership in those companies had when they got into difficulties, the first thing they did was to chop staff. Well, when you chop the heart, you know, when you chop staff, you often chop the heart out of your business. Yeah, and you no, deliver the same quality and customer satisfaction. Whereas there are a whole bunch of other places in the organization 
where if you know where to go look, you can trim the fat. And so in it, I have what's called the profit pillar. And, you know, that just shows where you can go and you can get more, you know, just by doing less and eliminating less people and mm. keeping your business framework together to deliver customer satisfaction. So. Very cool. Well, I will have all three of those read in a week. So I will have, have them in hand and I highly, highly recommend everybody grab those and read through those because what you're talking about is absolutely game changing. So thank you so much for being on today, Les. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Today's Business Leaders with Gabe Arnold. Remember to subscribe on iTunes. For more information, visit todaysbusinessleaders.com.